McKen Erickson, Razorfish, five. So McKen Erickson, New York, Razorfish, Los Angeles, and then five, New York. This is kind of the typical um, process for us. This is one of the largest, the client here is one of the largest hotel chains. He's undergoing a big, re big rebranding and he hires McKen to do the positioning, the brand strategy, the visual identity. Razorfish does um, the responsive website and then we're brought in to do the mobile UX and UI. So these are companies you know of. Um, if we're thinking local, New York, Brooklyn, then it's Athletics doing the visual identity. Uh, the ID firm is Pensa, who's doing industrial design on this project. And then we're in charge of the mobile UX and UI. So these are the kind of projects um, that we're working on. Um, so my name is Tin. I work as the creative director at Five, uh, mainly out of, out of our New York office, although we have amazing spaces here, but I um, got to see them three days ago. <laughs> um, So we do a lot of apps, and our apps have tons of users. More than 20 million users across all of our client apps. Um, and I would say with great, great power comes great responsibility. So when you're building um, digital products that so many people will, will use on a daily basis, um, you really need to know what you're building. Um, because a lot of our work is still in progress or under NDA, I'm not going to be able to sh show like ton of client work. I just want to have a few names that we're currently working for. Um, and you have some of them even here in this room with us. So that's, that's great. Um, this is a typical... Um, process. So it's you know going from idea to building something um, to then launching it and learning how users react, how well it performs, um, and then we need to kind of do the entire vicious cycle again. And obviously the, what we were thinking is how can we go from one part to another really quickly to learn as fast as possible without actually investing so much time, resources, and energy in the end um, in designing something, building something, launching it, pushing to the market, only to realize that it's not good enough or it doesn't work or um, it's not designed for people or no one has a need for it. We really want to reduce waste. There's so much waste in a typical um, product process um, that we want to reduce as much waste as possible. This goes from, you know, from communication, from the design. Um, you know, obviously, when we're into development, we don't want to think about, you know, will this UX work? And we're in the midst of development. That's how things were done back in the day. Um, so our take on this is design sprints. Um, we're not the only ones to do it, nor the first ones. Um, this is a five-phase uh, process, deeply rooted in design thinking, and it was conceived back in the day by IDEO, by Design Harvard School, um, and currently really you know, popularized by Google Ventures and their design studio. Um, but I'll, 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 you know, I'll tell you honestly, um, not a lot of agencies do that. Um, I can only name a few um, that do it um, and or do it successfully. So these are the typical five phases in a design sprint. Um, by default, this is a five-day workshop. So this is a hands-on, on-site, and, and I would stress a very... Uh, a very um, demanding, but in the end, very rewarding workshop. 
Um, so by default, it's five days. We've done two, three, eight days. It really doesn't matter. Kind of this is the this is the recipe, and then you can change the ingredients a bit. Um, phase one: understanding not just the scope of the work, but also um, the product, the product history, um, a lot of stakeholders. Um, prior to this, we do have like a, you know a pre-production where we do the research and kind of prepare ourselves and look at all the materials that the clients share, but only. This day one, being in the same room, someone, you know, forgot to mention something that's really, really important, and then we find that out um, on day one. And we also use the first day to kind of recognize opportunities. We decide the the focus for the next four days and what we're gonna design for. Um, second and third day, um, mostly sketching, going in as much directions as possible. Um, on day two, um, trying to validate ideas. Um, on day three, we pick the directions that we think will work. This can be one direction, it can be two or three, but we pick the direction and we do it in much more detail. Uh, the flow is longer, um, there's more steps and more fidelity to the product. Um, day four, um, Day four, it's only us, so <laughs> we're basically, you know, the design team. Um, my preference for the workshop is three people, um, so it's someone, you know, conducting the, the entire workshop. Um, it's a senior designer and then a, a product manager that's going to oversee um, when we go into design and development later on. Uh, so we build a prototype on day four, so this is one day for designing um, on your computer and doing a prototype. And on day five, uh, we test, and I'll touch that a bit later. So this is a photo from a workshop that was held uh, 10 days ago. It was in the beautiful New York Times building on the 38th floor. Um, and this is the, a bit of view you can see there. Um, and here is, is, is Darko, our lead designer, and, and this is the client. And always in these photos, you'll see a lot of um, whiteboards, paper, uh, markers, but then chocolate as well, because without chocolate, this workshop wouldn't be possible. Um, so this is, this is Andre, who you all met. Um, and this is for a client in Brooklyn. Um, um, I have some designs which I'll show there. It's called Farmigo, and this was from their design sprint. Obviously, the design process is broken without this <laughs> prototype module. So if, you know, if you're doing design and not focusing on prototyping, um, then you're doing something wrong. This is Jonathan Ive, and you know Apple is well known to have a very strong prototyping part of the design studio. Basically, they you know printer print in real time the prototypes of the products. Um, so this is a, a, a video. So this is a screencast of a real prototype. So this is for Ministry of Sound. Um, this was the final um, UX prototype that we built, but you can see all the features, flows, everything presented here, not touching on visual design at all. Okay, so this is, this is Farmigo. Farmigo is a VC-backed company um, that's they're doing CSA, so that's community supported agriculture. It's basically farm to table. So you order food directly from the farm and it gets delivered to you. So it's kind of bypassing um, consume in the middle. Um, I wanted to show you this because these are all prototypes. So this is the progression of a design as we go along. Um, this was the first prototype that was done at the design sprint. And then you can see as we progress how, you know, there's some color, but it's still not, you know, visual design. Then this is very close to the final product. 
Um, and then you have really, you know, polished visual designs, animation. These are also to validate ideas with a client, um, but deliverables, internal deliverables, so um, the development knows what and how to build it. Um, I know that I'm not going to dwell much on the tools because there's so many tools and everyone has a different preference. Um, this is kind of our setup. It's, it's basically Sketch, which allows us to be really fast and quick to do the rapid prototyping that we need to do on, on you know, one day um, really good. And then Envision for like the entire flow, and then Pixate and Framer for like smaller um, interactions that we need to kind of test out. Um, and you probably know all of these tools, Envision, and then Pixate, and these all have obviously different uh, interfaces as well. And then Framer, which is um, code based, so it's uh, CoffeeScript. So, user testing. Um, this is me um, in Arizona. This is the client's UX, test, UX testing, testing facilities. Um, this is a one-way or a two-way mirror. It's, I don't know how, how you can call the same thing, like a one-way or two-way mirror. Uh, but this is, so the setup here, uh, so this is day five of the design sprint. We have, um, I believe, five or six users. Uh, 60 minutes each, so a 60 minute long session with each and every user. Um, this is the second room where we have people from five and the client side as well taking notes. And then we have the third room where there's an open discussion. Um, it's not a quiet room. Um, and they're watching via live stream what's going on on the screen. They're having audio and you know people from our team are in real time fixing things, updating things, changing things. So updating the prototype, you know, between user two and three um, in any given moment. Um, so we did three workshops um, in Phoenix, and the second one was something that uh, RPM called um, Agile User Testing. So this was four days. We had five people each day. Um, and between days, we kind of completely changed the product. We, we came in with version A and B, and then came out with C, D, and E. And basically, reduced the amount of time, probably a month's work, into like four days. Just because we were on site, the you know, decision makers were, were on site, and we were very quick and rapid into seeing what works with users and how to um, change and update it. We use all um, inputs that we have. That we have. So it's um, um, top camera, uh, the device camera, uh, frontal camera, audio, and uh, um, sharing the screen, obviously. And then we combine everything into like one composite. Um, and these are all, as you see, so you know, on site. So we're actually talking to the people and understanding what's going on, because a lot of times you have a screen. And it's like, they go like this, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I get this, I like this, this is nice. And you, you can see, you know, their faces, they're, they're struggling with something. Uh, a lot of times people are polite, even in New York, people can be polite. Um, so that's why someone needs to be there, you know. If you use tools like usertesting.com, it's a great tool, and we sometimes, you know, use it if we need, like, a larger user base. Um, but that's not going to give you you know, what's going on. You're not going to be next to the person um, and you're not going to be able to kind of customize the questions and the flow uh, based on each um, different um, personality. And then this is the composite that, that I told you about. This is something um, similar to what the people in the third room were looking at. And, you know, there was some, like, micro copy that didn't uh, work for, like, the first two users. And we saw it was, like, confusing them. And... Um, you know, it didn't allow them to focus on the things we wanted them to focus on. So it's like, we changed that, you know. We changed that between user two and user three. So, in user testings, a lot of um, interesting things can happen. Um, so with, uh, with Rosetta Stone, um, we had a user who was paraplegic. 
and um, he actually had an assistant and it was very interesting trying to test out the prototype because obviously it's a prototype, it's on your device, but you can't use the accessibility features like you would in a um, developed app. Um, two weeks ago, I had a mother, so this was a product um, um, monitor, baby monitor. So we had a lot of mothers and one mother came in uh, with her child in a baby carriage. So we had to speak very softly and then, you know, and, I, I, and I'm getting, you know, a slack um, from people. It's like, we can't hear this session. It's like, we need to speak slowly, you know, uh, softly. There's a baby actually sleeping in the user <laughs> session. And then the third instance was a fire drill during the user testing. And it's like the most, you know, the loudest sound you can imagine starts after 20, 20 minutes in. And, you know, we just need to get up and, you know, follow the river of all people go walking outside the building and, you know, stopping the user testing. Um, so, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was also fun. So, Ev Williams, he says, you know, prototypes allows us to see what works and what needs work. And prototypes and user testing is something that's, you know, that we have in the process. So it's not something that comes when we're finished because at that point it's not going to give us any value. Um, and all the, all the work that we did in the last six months, um, I'm displaying on this slide here. <laughs> just because we still can't show anything. Um, working for Choice Hotels, um, they're the fifth largest um, hotel chain in the States. They have half a million uh, hotel rooms. They have a revenue of 700 uh, million a year. And obviously, a lot of that flows through the app. So it's really important to do the user testing, to know what we're building, uh, to test assumptions, and to go from there. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to take a seat now, uh, where all of you are probably very hungry and want to go to lunch. Um, but I, I would just like to, you know, open up the floor for questions um, and take it from there. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned Design Sprint. Who takes part in Design Sprint? Who are from the, all from the client side? Uh, from everyone's side, so from the clients and the agency side, who is okay. involved? So like a perfect number of people is six, seven, eight. Um, from our side, as I said, it's, it's three people. So it's, you know, let's say myself, one of our senior UX designers, um, and then a, a product manager. So we need someone that's, uh, you know, going to be involved in the process from start to end, and then the PM is the one that's going to oversee the design phase, and then you know heading into development. So that's from our side. Um, from the client side, it really depends on the type of company and the company size. So we had design sprints with one founder. Um, so we had like one guy; he's a CEO and founder, and we you know we had. Um, and then we had, uh, for instance, the Choice Hotels, um, the first day understanding, this wasn't one day with them because we had like 12 uh, sessions with key stakeholders. So this was interviewing, um, marketing, BI, um, international, um, products, design team. So we were interviewing everyone. So in the first day we have stakeholder interviews with um, all the departments, and this can depend, you know, I usually invite, um, you know, whoever our, our contact is, I, I tell him, you know, let's invite everyone that can contribute. Um, but then uh, the, the second and the third day, um, it's usually, you know, the product owner, uh, someone from their uh, design team, and I like to have someone from engineering as well. Um, and I, you know, when those guys start sketching, I love that because we learned so much that no one thought of sharing before. And it's like, you know, they, they make this very, you know, basic sketch. And then we start talking about the sketch, you know. The sketch is just kind of an introduction to, 
And then we start talking and then he mentions something that like the 15 people we interviewed yesterday failed to mention, like no one told us that. And it's, you know, when, when you're going into an organization, it has a lot of legacy history and, and we need to kind of somehow compress that and insert that into our minds um, very quickly. Okay, but it's important to have someone who's a decision maker from the client. Yes, of course, yeah. So that's, you know, that's the product owner, whoever that is. So on, um, on, on day three, even on day two sometimes, so we do the dot voting. Um, so when we have kind of the final round of, final round of designs and versions up on the screen, on the, on the, on the walls in the, in the entire room, um, then we give dots. I like to give the same amount of dots and um, little chocolate bars, uh, preferably Croatian if we have them. Um, and then the decision maker gets uh, double the dots. Um, and then you see how like groups of dots start emerging and then you understand like, okay, these are the three ideas that people are really passionate about and they, everyone thinks that, you know, we should um, go in that direction. And we didn't have trouble with like, you know, the decision maker, it's like, you know, no, like, I don't agree what you know the entire company and like what you said, but it's like they're always very kind of understandable. Uh, you know, they're maybe pushing um, a small segment that they think we should test. But I'm also open to that, you know, because we're testing. We're, we're investing like five days. So even if the if the user testing shows that like you know we've built something that no one wants, that's a really great starting point for the, the entire design phase. You know, that hasn't happened yet, but it could happen. Yes. Thank you. Just one before you, sorry. <laughs> Can you tell me more, uh, what, what kind of project does Design Sprint apply to? Does it apply only to new startups, new ventures, new products, or? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so, I, you know, failed to mention that we do sprints for both large, large corporations. So, you know, enterprises, I've told you, they have like 20 departments, and also small startups. So it's anywhere in between. We use this to kick off projects, uh, but this can be done. Um, so next week in New York, we have a, a design sprint um, with a you know s smaller startup, but they have a product out. They they've had it out for a year. They're constantly iterating, and they need help just on one specific feature that they're going to roll out. So we can use this to you know um, you know kickstart projects, but also to come in. Um, very precisely to solve a specific problem need um, in an existing product. Yeah. Okay, so just like an add-on to a previous question, how do you handle uh, clients that are really passionate and want to do design? You mentioned the dots, but what if he really insists like I want a big red byte now button in the middle of the screen? That doesn't happen to us, I don't know. Um, it's, you know, I would have a conversation with him to try to, I always try to understand why he's saying that, actually. What's, what's going on, um, what's his incentive to kind of push um, a feature, a question, a button, a design decision? And we try to, you know, neutralize it somehow. I'll give you, I'll give you an example uh, with one of our clients. So there were, so we were discussing like the, uh, the best approach for the home screen. Right, that's obviously, you know, it's like with the web, it's a very passionate subject, everyone has their opinion, you know, what the first, and when I hear, you know, above the fall, like on mobile screens, whatever. But they were very passionate about one direction, and we thought it wasn't a good direction to take, based on our, obviously, domain knowledge, but also what the users told us um, in the first session. So we were, so we built a um, uh, prototype with their version, and then we built a second prototype, which was, you know, taking some ideas that they want to have, but redesigning it in a completely different way. And then we, and then we had user testing on that, uh, which was a few days. It wasn't one day. It was a few days. Um, and then they saw how users reacted. And they, you know, <laughs> it, it, it was funny. So this was, from their side, it was like, you know, five, six, seven people. And everyone is, you know, was telling me, okay, everyone is on board, except the, obviously the main, you know, VP who they sold that internally to, and he wasn't in the room. So they were like, 
you know, they prepped the stage and then they just brought him in and he was like, Tin, now go ahead. <laughs> like everyone's, we're behind you, but we're behind you, you know. <laughs> you have to now say this to our, um, to our boss. But, you know, when he saw data, our clients are, you know, smart, intelligent people and with reasoning, with data, we don't have issues, you know. So it's like that's, that's, the, that's why the design sprint and the on-site presence is really, really great. At what point do you include uh, kind of the technical assessment of cost? I mean, I've seen sometimes many kind of what seemingly small design features can end up having an unexpected technical cost and then a lot of work has been done on design and then the product owner comes and goes like, oh God, I didn't know it was gonna take that long. Can you redesign this? At what point do you bring a developer in is it part of the design sprint? Is it day one. result? Day one. Okay. Day one, we bring the developer. We build, bring the the PMs on the client side that kind of have a understanding. And because we have obviously kind of a great development team in house, so we're not you know we're a design and development um, agency. And and this knowledge that we have that our designers have in terms of how much something is going to cost mm -hmm. that also helps us. But I bring you know engineer engineering is one of the you know, um, most one of the most important departments to have the interviews with, and then I even try to have like one person from their their team be involved in the second and third day um, when we're sketching, when we're going through ideas. So it's not like they're brought in later. It's like, oh, what did you do, guys? It's like you know, you messed everything so, up. So the developer is sitting in there on day one of the design sprint, and yes. through the through the entire sprint. Yes, but uh, so day four we're. Um, you know, hammering out the prototypes, and then we just have like a two or three uh, syncs throughout the day to present progress. And then day, day five is obviously just, you know, user testing. Um, and it, it depends on the company. Sometimes they're very involved, so they're in the next room looking and streaming. Sometimes it's just on us. Um, because after the design sprint, obviously, we, you know, deliver videos. We de uh, deliver like a video summary, you know, that kind of encapsulate, encapsulates in like 15 minutes what was going on in the user testing. And then we have a long uh, report deck with, you know, all versions, users, percentages, and what we saw and what we feel are the best next steps. Those are kind of our suggestions. And then we go from there to kind of estimate the entire project, you know, maybe... They, on day two, a lot of times we do uh, information architecture, um, the content model. It, you know, so that kind of is a good starting point to start building out an estimate for either the, you know, just the, how long the entire design phase is going to take after that, and development, of course. You talked about user testing. How do you source users, and what are your typical group size? Um, yeah, so that relates to the conversation you had about the number of people. Uh, so we do. So we so we have six users per day. Uh, we have six because we need five, and uh, <laughs> we believe that someone is gonna be a no-show. So we need to make sure we have six. You need to overbook twenty percent. Uh, that's the kind of rule of thumb. Um, we source users. Our, you know ourselves when it's a smaller client, a startup. We use. Um, um, internal network, we work the company that we um, have a space in that has a large, large user base. We use Craigslist. And then for um, our enterprise clients, uh, we have um, basically external partners that are just focused on recruiting users, um, incentives, and then we use um, in Manhattan, we use their um, UX testing lab with you know two-way mirrors and with the entire setup. So you know startups obviously can't afford this. So with them, uh, we do it a bit guerrilla styled in a meeting room, and, and we source the users as ourselves. And when it's a you know bigger client, then we have someone taking care of that part. Uh, if you are building application for doctors, let's say uh, for. Doctors. Doctors. Or, yeah, very specific uh, public. Would you make testing just on them, or you will choose uh, general users uh, to see how they feel applications? Um, I would use doctors, definitely, yeah. Uh, so we had a, a potential client that um, has like 300 laboratories um, in the States. Um, 
you know, they draw blood and stuff like that. Um, and uh, their user base are either medical staff in hospitals or in, you know, private offices. Um, so with, with, five, with the five users that I mentioned, so this is five users per a user group. So if you have, you know, let's say this was the, the case, you need 10 users. Uh, the baby monitor, we have uh, five moms, five dads, and then five others, which is nannies, um, uh, sleep trainers, um, grandmas, whatever, you know, but it's, it's, it's five per user group, yeah. But I would definitely, you know, test on the, uh, the users that will actually use the app. And some things, you know, uh, run across the board, so we know that, you know, if you have the dots, 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 or if you have content that's cut off, that's going off screen, everyone intuitively scrolls, swipes, you know, so stuff like that um, is normal, yeah. Thank you. Hey, Tim. I will. I have a question for you. Uh, can you share any key experiences or moments um, in your evolution as, as a designer, you know, like to where you, to where you are now and how you, on your, I know it's kind of a tough question. Put you on, sorry to put you on the spot. But <laughs> any, okay. any, you know, moments uh, or, or projects maybe where you had like a, an aha moment that, that led, to, led you to where you are now? Aha moment. Yeah. I think honestly the prototyping was like the biggest um, milestone, you know, once... I have, I have this slide in, in one of my older decks, you know, when people were building products and it, were, it, it wasn't called products back in the day, it was called software, right? In the late 80s, you had um, a business guy with some money and then he went to developers and he gave money and was like, build, build me something, right? And then 90s, late 90s, you had kind of the designers came in and then they were basically, you know, drawing pretty pictures before the software gets built or the website gets built. And now there's a step before this. Obviously, we have, you know, research to validate the market, the industry, the competitors, whatever. But then we have product design that needs to kind of, you know, define what the product is. Um, and then we have, you know, UX and UI. But validating very early on is only possible with, you know, rapid prototyping. Sometimes, sometimes we have, um, sometimes with uh, estimates for clients. Um, so I believe like Five is an agency that does estimates and proposals very differently. Um, because we, when it makes sense for us, we deliver uh, like a really high level prototype um, alongside the estimate. Um, I don't think any other agencies do that. Um, from our side, this is an investment that can be anywhere between 60 minutes and three hours, four hours time. Um, it's to show the, the, um, the client how we work. It's, you know, everyone is on board in terms of like the designers and developers to be ab actually be able to scope the project so they understand what we're gonna build. And then, you know, the client loves that because they were struggling, they're a startup, they were struggling for four months with an idea, with like a product vision, and then we just crunch that and just display it. The, the point of the prototype is just to have something phys physical, it's, it's digital, but it's like, it's something in your hands that you can have a conversation around with. It's not like, you know, a long specification document that obviously we need at some point, uh, but, you know, our, when we're working with uh, startups on day five, the founder has the prototype on their phone. And they're playing around with the prototype the entire weekend. They, you know, they call us hyped Monday morning because you know, they've spent like you know, two hours and it's like, they, they finally, we can finally start having a conversation about what needs to be built. So I think that was you know, something that really kind of changed, changed things for me, is like this, um, you know, the prototyping part.